Um, I don't think your mic is on right now. That's fine. Hi. I'm Kyle. It's nice Zelle to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, Let me see if I can get less. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's the, the thing with this thing it's so tricky it's like trying to find a place in your like house to position it so people don't <laughs> you're like they, they don't need to see what's going on yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was watching you check yourself out and getting ready for this mm-hmm. and you that was before you you could see me <laughs> it's okay <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, it looked like I was the only one here, and um, <laughs> I was talking to my partner because um, uh, about this um, because I've been really looking forward to it. Um, Weezer yeah. and I know each other because uh, Weezer and I went to secondary school together a long time ago, so oh. that's how um, Weezer and I know each other. And um, yeah, so when he was organizing this, and he was like, "Oh, we need." Um, people in the arts and cosmopolitanism panel I was like yes of course like why (laughs) (laughs) yeah um, yeah I'm super excited to chat to you though um, especially like so I'm an artist and and like I'm a gallery artist and this is a conversation that we're going to get into um, okay in in the panel but as a gallery artist and you being you know of being of Jenna gallery also Mm -hmm. um, I I do think that it's important to start talking about like especially like right now like COVID you know and just being like that's that's messed everything up for a lot of people how how has it done that for you well, um, I had a show in San Francisco that I'd been oh. anticipating for over a year. Oh, wow. And then, uh, yeah, just close, that's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So nobody saw it. You know? and, and, and it was one of those things because I had been, it was the first show that a gallery had reached out to me so long in advance, you know? And so I was very excited. I was like, oh, I'm a legitimate artist. I have like a, a year ahead for the show. I know it's happening. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling myself a little bit. And then and then it happened. And then they, all the galleries closed and none of the collectors could see the show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's messed everyone up, but... Are they open to doing it later once this, you know, kind of is under control, if ever? Um, no, no. Uh, they, they, they were, they've documented the show and everything, but um, we're, we're actually picking up the artwork now. Um, so that's just kind of it's 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 a moment that's gone, and it's cool, you know. More will come. Um, it's it, it teaching it's teaching you know me to think outside of the box and also just to like to think about like different ways to monetize the work and whatever so this is definitely something that we will be getting into you know leveraging our own networks and things like that um but yeah yeah are you in zambia right now yes i am i'm in lusaka mm-hmm. nice and sunny you know i have never been to lusaka you're missing out. Oh, Zambia. And, and it's such a shame because it's right next door, you know. Where are you from? <laughs> yeah, you're missing Malawi. out. Malawi. Yes, it is such a shame. Yeah. Yeah, it is such a shame. I'm, I'm, I'm working on fixing it because you can even drive. You don't have to take yeah. a plane, you know. You don't even have to fly. <laughs> and mean, I think uh, our borders are open. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I've been monitoring flights in and out of the continent, and it looks like Zambia is one of the only countries that has got daily flights to Ethiopia. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's the only if one. We that... close our borders, we're doomed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah. relate. All right. I heard that people are still quiet. So we have about three minutes. That, that okay. if they have to um, fly through Zambia. Okay, three yeah. minutes out. Is okay, everybody here. I, I'm here with three other panelists. They're just fixing okay. and working on a few hiccups. Okay, sounds good. Okay. 
Okay, awesome. Um, we have 33 people live on the platform and eight people watching us right now. So oh. I, I think we'll wait maybe for another eight minutes before we start. Mm -hmm. Are they watching? Uh, okay, right? Raphael. I see Raphael's here. Yeah. Yes, there are eight, nine people watching us right now. <laughs> Backstage. backstage. No, there's no backstage here. This is front stage. Oh, wow. I got a request. I, I got a request for for Raphael to join. Um, I tried to accept it, but he's not. Uh, just, just. Okay, let me try and set him up. Hello, hello, and welcome to the people who are joining us. We are just waiting for um a few more panelists to join us, and then we will um start uh just sorting out a few technicalities so just hang in there and we're going to get this conversation going in a little bit all right i think we should we can get started now um welcome everybody we have 26 people that are watching live um and 52 people joining i think um more and more people will join as the sessions uh, progress um yes attendance of typically about 100 people per session and we have over 1,068 registered guests for different sessions um, throughout today. So yeah, to part two, uh, day two of the African Renaissance Conference. Um, my name is Wiza, Wiza Jalakasi. I'm one of the event organizers and your general tech support guy. So you might see me pop in and out to transition panels. Um, very, very pleased to have you on board, Kyle and Zelipa. Uh, really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to share. I'm hoping the other panelists can join us soon, but in the interest of time, we must begin uh, immediately. We are running a very tight ship at this event. It's very, very un-African. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of Africans being on time. What is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the new African Renaissance. The new African Renaissance. It's not the old right. Africa. <laughs> mm -hmm. We... All right, then. We're mostly on time. I think it's just technical uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. The other panelists are with me here. We're just having okay. a bit like of physically. Trouble. Yes. Um, they're waiting to be added to the panel. Approval. Okay. Okay. That that's. Give me a sec. Let me, let me look into that right now. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to like leave from this account and then try and join in from um, the other one. But, but there are no um, there are no requests that are pending for moderation, and I have already pre-approved them. Mm. Um, okay, just ask them to try and refresh, uh, Zelipa. Please try and refresh. Mm. They're doing as asked. Okay. I've just changed the, the the setting for this panel to allow anyone in. Uh, please, attendees, do not try to enter. <laughs> it's going to make it that much harder for us to um, get the show started. So just ask, ask the other panelists to refresh, and I think they should be able to um, log in. Hopin is a very new platform, and the team that developed it is actually actively working on updates as we speak. So some of the things are a little bit buggy, but it's worked really, really well so far. And yesterday, um, we had a great experience. We didn't have any technical issues whatsoever. We have to take into account Wi-Fi and load shedding. <laughs> Two of my favorite words. <laughs> Okay.
can everybody hear me? Yes, my bad. I was saying. <laughs> I was on mute. I was I was saying that um, Zelipa and Seppo, you can't be in the same room because there's uh, feedback from your microphones. So either Zelipa or whoever is on Seppo's account, you must move. You must be physically in different rooms or preferably outside as far away from each other as possible. But you can't you can't be in the same room. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was actually going to suggest that at some point, if it's more convenient, since you're all physically in the same space, you can just like, you know, connect to one machine. All right, I'm gonna try and unmute Seppo's account now because I've seen that Zalipa has moved. Okay, that should be much better. Um, Seppo, can we hear you guys on Seppo's account? We're only hearing silence. Hi, hi, can you hear? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. All right, I think we're good to go. This is a fantastic setup. Yeah. Can you hear us? Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Yeah, can hear you just fine. Uh, Zelipa, wherever you are, please shut the door. It's done. (laughs) Can you hear me? Fantastic. Yeah, everyone's all good to go. Um, I think this is where I drop off now. Kyle, it's your show. Have a great time. Enjoy. All right, thank you, Isa. Um, welcome, everybody, panelists and attendees. My name is Kyle Malanda, and I'm from Malawi. Uh, I'm a visual artist, and my background um, spans a lot of different places. I grew up in the UK. I, um, I've also, I'm also like Chinese and American educated, and currently I split my time between um, the San Francisco Bay Area and Malawi. So. Um, Today, I just wanted to talk about, uh, today we're going to talk about art and cosmopolitanism and the questions that we're going to tackle are, what is the role of art in transforming culture? And what role does art play in fostering internationalism? And we have a great um, panel with us. We have Zelipa Mulwanda of Chena Gallery. We have Seppo, Dr. Seppo Musok, doctor. Not, <laughs> we need to address people correctly. <laughs> doctor. Seppo Musokotwane of Class Guru. We also have James Sakata and Julia Mutale joining us. Um, So I will start by handing off one by one. Everybody can introduce themselves and tell the audience a bit about themselves. We will start with you, Zelipa and James. Um, So just a quick correction, Kyle. This is Raphael Chilufia. Oh, my goodness. It's okay. I, I was waiting for an opportunity. I think the to... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zelipa Mulwanda. I am a mm-hmm. co-founder of Chenna Art Gallery. So we are a digital art gallery that's uh, working on uh, showcasing local and African arts online. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to my colleague here. I am Raphael Chilufia, a visual artist, ceramist, and uh, experienced about things like uh, draftsmanship or something, but uh, currently a visual artist. And we're both from Zambia. From Zambia. We're in Lusaka. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Seppo, or doctor, as we like to say, Dr. Seppo Musokotwani from Chenna Gallery. Passionate about education, um, co founder of a couple of education projects, as well as Chenna Gallery, director within Chenna Gallery. So, um, working closely with Zelipa to be alive, um, to bring to life a lot of the concepts and to present our artists professionally. Um, and really just enjoy building and seeing greatness come out of them. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me and over to Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia Mutale and I'm from Zambia. I am a development economist. I have a passion for art. I'm a self-taught artist and I currently um, own a store in Lusaka called Hipego. And um, we are a store that sells local crafts, handcrafts mainly made by Zambians. 
right, so we are going to get right into it. Um, the elephant in the room, COVID. Uh, in what ways do you see the art world or the, the art scene in Africa being changed by it? Or rather, how can artists leverage this time, which is a very difficult time, um, in order to, to, to foster cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism and internationalism um, during this very difficult time of um, COVID with, with a lot of uncertainty. How have you been managing that at Chenna Gallery? Great. So basically, one of the things that we've been working on is ensuring we're digital. So we have our artists present art. We present it online. Um, and to answer your question about other artists as well, we've developed quite a strong, close-knit global community of artists, um, and we get to interact with them, you know, have webinars now and again. Um, but more exciting is Zelipa and our um, initiative, which is in collaboration with Nkwashi and Double GDP to have an artist in residence program. So we'll have three Zambian guys living at Nkwashi but they were surrounded in less than a couple of days by artists all over the world, from Turkey, Israel, Russia, to just support them through this journey. Basically, Chenna Gallery is moving forward with uh, online presentations of arts, online exhibitions. There's lots of fun activities. We, we want to see our artists get um, well understood and known um, around the world. Um, yeah. Great. Zalipa, do you have anything to add? Um, well, just a, just a little bit. Uh, we are happy to create this platform that um, allows not just local uh, art lovers to have, um, to enjoy what our local artists are doing, but we are also exposing them to the world and also the world to them, right? So usually you will find that, especially on the continent, it's only in your country that people will see your art. Uh, unless you're fortunate enough to find somebody who actually invests in you and you're able to e exhibit uh, across the world. So this sort of allows those who are not able to yet um, to showcase the work that they've been doing, but also allows them to interact with other African artists. And I think that's something that we're big on as Chenna, to have artists have a community, not just locally in your country, because our cultures, while they are different in Africa, they are very similar and very rich in their in their localness. But if you put it together, just think about all the stuff that we could work on or artists could work on uh, and what kind of pieces, what kind of sculptures, whatever your genre might be in the art world, what you could produce. And if we're trying to sort of buy into um, African, African uh, way of doing art, uh, create your own standard, uh, create your own um, following um, instead of so much trying to mimic what has already been done. We have, we are in a place where things are a bit different and so we have to think of, think outside the box. Uh, and that's what we're trying to get our artists to do and more so present yourself in an acceptable standard anywhere in the world. It might not be what people are used to, but it's still, you know, unique to self and also acceptable to anybody who sees it. That's really great that you're talking about having a unique standard that's very specific to African artists and not having artists imitate um, others in a way that's not really contributing anything besides just copying. And I do think that part of the problem is also... Um, there's an expectation, you know, about what African art is. You know, the, it's it's the you have the painting of, of the mama and yeah. the, the, <laughs> she's got a child and the you know and, and there's a baobab tree here. There's exactly. An, and, you know, the, the, there's a very specific yeah. 
expectation about what African art should look like. And I think that sometimes we, we can, and I find myself, you know, having to constantly talk myself out of it, like, don't fall into the trap, don't fall into the trap, where, where you're making something just so that people can know that it's an uh, African. Identify it. Yeah. Ex- exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so uh, in what ways do you uh, create an environment to, to encourage African artists to, to break out of that, to, to tell them that you can talk about anything that impacts your life as an African. You don't have to just talk about the trauma and, you know, the poverty and the colonialism. In what ways can we encourage an environment that that, that fosters that kind of exploration and, and encourages that kind of exploration? Well, I think... This is open to anybody. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll just talk a little bit about that. Um, I think it's important to... First of all, let's take it back to... Um, you just spoke about how, you know, you you have to sort of conform to doing things because of the environment. But how we're trying to break out of that is that if you are a true artist, and this is the thing that you love to do, um, through whatever environment you're in is where you're creating all these wonderful pieces. So you have to be uh, true to self in that you don't uh, get start making pieces that will sell and are expected of you. And that those are the conversations that we are trying to have with our artists to say, look, paint what you feel. And because we are able to put your pieces on a global market and a global stage, you don't have to worry about how locals or even expats who come to the country have this view of what African art should look like. They should come here and say, okay, you still have your, your mamas with a baby on the back or with something on the head. That's for me, we're kind, you, you can portray that as art, but I also feel like that's more of a cultural thing that we show through paintings. So it's, I don't want to say here that I'm discounting it as an artwork, but we we have those who actually paint from, you know, this is how I'm feeling at this time and they're creating such wonderful stuff. And we are trying to say, look, even though you're not getting a lot of people looking at those pieces, eventually people will learn that Being an artist does not mean that you conform to what people who buy art expect, but you are the artist. So you are the the teller of the story. And we are just here to enjoy the journey with you. Truly enjoy that. And I do want um, an artist perspective. So I would love to hear from Raphael. What is is your perspective on this and how does that um, impact the way that you make ceramics? You know, <clears throat> we are all unique. That's maybe touch the aspect of uh, uh, being an artist, like uh, Zaliba talked about, the way we are supposed to come out. On a personal level, we are unique. Sometimes we follow the emotion, the feeling. And then you have to understand the environment under which you live. If I look at uh, Ceramics, what you talked about. I have worked with, with Julia before. She's on the panel. <laughs> I'm happy. Um, in fact, what is most important, I have seen that we, seems to, we seem to overlook everywhere, even for the things that we have important. For the first time, we have been talk about this thing. Identity is very, very important. As an artist, whatever you do comes from deep down yourself and out. Unique as you are, unique should be seen from whatever you do. So as a ceramist, a designer in ceramics, uh, we were given to do according to what we wanted, to show people what we were doing. And if you do something, it always came not from what other people have done, but deep from inside. And then when you do that, especially because you are in that environment. What you bring about on that piece you're working on is something 
that you have a feeling of in you. It comes out that way. And if it does come from deep down you, no matter what, it affects anybody who looks at that because that's you, your identity on that object. That always has an impact. Situations to come. We have this time. We have a different situation where we have uh, events which are so, 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 so different happening in an environment like Zambia and unique one, which is the last one, the COVID-19, uh, which has made us stay in one place. You know, you are made not to move because you fear, so you concentrate and discover even much more you never expect. This means that you're strengthening yourself. Somewhere. And then what you have, you're sharing to others. It influences. And uh, being so lucky that this is the time we've come to meet with China, their intention to improve it and assist artists, especially to broaden the market, has been a very, very good time for us. Because uh, there are no places you can go into Zambia, in Zambia where you can go and have your work put on internet to open markets into the whole world. This is quite unique. And unfortunately, I've come to find myself to be the first one. This is an impact. Now, it's my turn, if I'm given what to do, can I do the best I can so that I send for them to show the whole world what we are. You know, we are Africans, and if our ideas come from deep down us, we bring Africanness in any way. You do a painting, you make a piece of sculpture, or anything that you do, from deep down yourself. You are in an environment, especially if you have been traveled out, having not listened to anybody tell you what is the best experience and good. If you're mature enough, you hear people telling you things, sometimes you get inside and you can't believe it's true. Then what you can do can be unique, African and natural. You know, I'm given work to do, whether I do on a ceramic piece, I do a realistic work. Whatever form I do must show that by nature. I live under the sun in this country. Trees and other objects cast shadow. And if the line I mean is that one, then I have to do in accordance with the way I am, what I am. And if I come out that, I don't think the environment will be exactly as it is in the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. No. My place is hot. And naturally, I'll come out, out Zambian and unique. So this has given a very, very good chance for us to go deep down and learn things uh, uh, and even wanting to share. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And, and you've talked about working with Julia before. So Julia, a question to you is, in what ways do you leverage your networks to, um, to, to collaborate with people? Because I do think that that's one of the most important things in the art world, especially in Africa, because there's it's there's growth under funding, and the only way that we can really do anything is by working to mm -hmm. and skill sharing. So, if you could just talk to us a little bit about how you, as an artist, navigate that, and also as a business owner creating arts and crafts, how do you navigate that? Yes. Um... I worked with him uh, when we ran a ceramics company called More Pottery. And we had uh, all sorts of artists pass through More Pottery. And um, they had the freedom to create what they wanted, how they wanted, when they wanted, with guidance, of course. But um, we had to close down More Pottery. And I, my background, as I said, I'm a development economist but I really, really have a passion for art. That's what I really wanted to study. But um, I grew up in an era where you were directed by your parents as to where you should go and what you should learn. Mm. I have a daughter now and she loves art and I am encouraging her to do art. 
But if my father had his way, I would have been a banker <laughs> or an accountant. So um, having that background as a development economist, I thought to myself, how can I work with artists to promote Zambian art mm. and on, on, on the Zambian basket? Yes. And I worked with rural women that produce these baskets. And that's a, it's a dying art because you find that uh, you have these master weavers and they grow old and they don't pass that knowledge on to the younger ones because the younger ones are not interested in learning how to weave baskets. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I worked with a group of uh, women in the west part of Zambia and in the yeah. And I was able to take them to Santa Fe, to the international folk art market. And these are rural women, they're villagers. They had the exposure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the folk art market celebrates mm -hmm. uh, folk art, original art. Not, um, not uh, art that promotes the lady on the, on yeah. the back, yeah. but it, it promotes... Um, celebrating the craft, the, the actual craft of making baskets or the actual crafts of making traditional knives. Mm. Um, it's a beautiful market. For those of you who have the chance, I'd I'd, I'd love you to Google it. And unfortunately, because of COVID, they're not having it this year. It's a beautiful market in, 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 in Santa Fe. So that's the way I have, ha have worked to promote um, particularly Zambian crafts and also... Um, Bill said, for example, the basket, traditionally it was used for thing and uh, um, as a marriage basket or, you know, um, to do a house, household uh, chores. Mm. But over the years, we have um, developed the basket into things like uh, lampshades, laundry baskets. So it adds, uh, we're still celebrating the craft, but we are using it in a, a cosmopolitan way, <laughs> may I yes. say. Yeah. So that's how I've worked with, with, the, with the craft people. That's really beautiful because I, I, I wanted us to also touch on what development actually looks like for, for a you know and, and so just taking um you know preserving that cultural knowledge which which is which is being lost you know and and part of it the reason it's being lost is because people don't associate it with development anymore you know yeah. so 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 when people these days think of development they're thinking of concrete and and this disconnection from the land you know that they're thinking i have to live in a city i have to be this solitary unit by myself and so I, I do think that it is really important to take um, cultural knowledge that's been passed down and, and somehow preserve it or, or reimagine it, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're still using those same te techniques and I'm um, and, and still like going about it, but going about it in a different way. And, and I, I, I'm also really interested in um, what you have to say, Julia, but also everybody about this uh the connection that you made with with women from rural areas, because I do think that one of the biggest problems is that urban Africans are the ones driving the conversations about Africa. And mm -hmm. I think that there comes a point where a lot of people are going to be left behind and they're already being left behind in in the conversations. Um, so how do we how do we navigate that? Because, you know, I mean, the fact that we're, we're here talking on our little electronic devices, you know, about what, what Africa looks like and what African art is and, you know, um, and how we navigate that. How, how do we, how do we um, push the art world forward in a, in a way that does not leave people in the rural areas behind? Because I feel like that's part of the problem. You know, what we're doing now is when urban Africans are the only ones driving the conversation about Africa, we also don't get a holistic picture, a holistic sense of what else is happening. Um, so besides uh, co collaborating with women in rural areas, uh, do you guys, um, have you guys done anything 
uh, to to sort of foster that that connection, that that interdependence between rural and urban. Or what ideas do you, what other ideas do you have around that? Hello and welcome, James. <laughs> Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> Love the hat. Love it. So, uh, everybody, this is James. Um, before we get into that question, James, just please give a quick introduction to the audience so we know a bit about you. Oh, your mic is on mute, I think. Can you try speaking again? Hmm. No. No, it's not. Uh, we're experiencing a few technical difficulties with James right now. Weezer, um, if you could jump in. Well, maybe Julia could answer the question while we're getting him sorted. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it comes from, I'll go back to what he said. It yeah. comes from a personal passion, um, a personal, um, uh, yeah, it comes from a personal passion from us who are in the uh, urban areas to go and uh, change all these wonderful people who have these. Um, uh, various skills, you know, that uh, were handed down to them, yeah. and to encourage the, the 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 generation coming after us. Uh, funny, we, we were talking about generation because my daughter was asking <laughs> Doctor here, "What are you? Are you a?" I'm a lot of things. A millennial? <laughs> are you a Generation yeah. X? Well, I said, well, I'm a baby boomer. Yeah. But then it, 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 the onus is then on the individual, <laughs> on the individual artists yeah. and the passion that we, we have, you know, to take time to go into the rural areas and encourage the artists there and promote them. Yeah. And one thing um, to emphasize for true to uh, true to Zelipa, Julia, Raphael, myself, and probably James as well, once he can speak is especially for Chenna, we're all about going to get the authentic story from the artists themselves, even if it's in their language and we have to figure out how to get a close translation to share with other people. So different languages said as the basket weaver, what she used the basket for, um, culturally, what's the connotation behind the colors or the grasses that are used, how do they dry, the, the process, the motifs, everything. And it, it it's about the urban people going to the rural people and getting the story. It's us. We go and we get the story and get the story behind the story, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's the way we keep it. And also just to add on to, to what both uh, and Julia have said, it's also when you go to the rural areas, don't just go to buy the product, okay? Because then you miss the opportunity to learn. So it's also important to know who these women are, what are their stories, men and women, because let's not assume it's just women who make these baskets, but men and women, what are they doing? And also paying a fair price, right? So that way they're not, yeah, you, you might, um, you, you're going to resell, but you're also um, empowering somebody else by, we, we have this, a lot of us do it. You find a lady on the corner of the street selling tomatoes and you're just going to, she's like, okay, this is 15 kwacha. You'll be like, ah, I've got 10 kwacha, you know? But this lady is selling this so that she can educate children, you see? So it's, it's about going to the rural areas and being conscious of the impact that you're, 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 you're having there. And making sure that while you're on this journey to uh, tell stories and learn them yourself, that you are 
including the people who are making these beautiful things. And as long as you're working with them, their lives are also changing. I think that's how, that's another, that's one way you can bring them along. So it's, it would be nice to see she was living in a, a one room house and throughout working with you maybe a year or two, there's a change in her mm-hmm. life. Maybe she has, um, I might get killed for saying she, she had one cow. Now she has two cows. Mm. Where my mother comes from, we speak in cows. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's a huge thing. <laughs> So it's about um, not just getting and, you know, changing your own life. I think it's about bringing everybody along on the journey so that their lives are changed. And the story is, right, you bring it to town. We don't tell our children anything about it. My son will just think it's a market of the wall, not knowing where it comes from, what it does, because mom thinks it looks nice on the wall and that's it. You see, so it's also just about not just in the rural areas, but in the urban areas. Coming back to what you were saying about stories, those who are the holder of the stories are dying and nobody, you know, to continue these stories. Eventually, we're going to have people who don't even remember what these baskets were about. We might even have a machine making the baskets in a couple of years. Who knows? So, yes, yes, I can hear you, people. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you now. We can hear you now. Great, great. How is everyone doing? Sorry, I apologize for being late to the party. (laughs) I was trying to navigate my way. You know, I've never used uh, this thing, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, now everyone has disappeared. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Am I clear? Ah, great, great. Okay, so um, my name is James Sakala. I was born in Zimbabwe, but I'm very much Zambian. I grew up in Zambia in, in Mukushi, and I'm a, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a musician, I'm an Afro jazz singer. Um, well, my Afro jazz has a fusion of Kalindula as well. So I sing very ethnic traditional music. I don't know if uh, there's any of you that has stumbled upon my music anyway, but I love culture. I love uh, being Zambian, being African, and that's what I stand for. And I was mentored by the late Oliver Mtukudzi. Yeah. That's amazing. The roots still with you. Now I'm saying, there you go. James still has his Zimbabweans roots with him, with exactly. Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, and I do think um, this is the perfect time from talking about preserving that cultural knowledge that a lot of um, people in the rural area still hold to how it then translates into something like music. Because one of the things that Oliver Mtukuzi was most well known for was for the fact that he seldom sang in English. Most of his songs were in Shona, you know? So, um, and and that's one of the things that I I, I deeply enjoy that you oftentimes, I don't feel that you have to translate music because if it's good music, it's going to transcend linguistic boundaries. So could you tell us a little bit about your process and also um, how you're rooted in that by you, um, you, you preserve that cultural identity in your music? Uh, so for me, uh, before I started doing my music, before I started singing the music that I sing, I used to be a backup singer for uh, the modern musicians that we have in the country. 
I worked with um, a lot of musicians for about three to four, five years. And I've been a songwriter for all these years and a producer before I started recording. So when I started recording, I, I remember I had to quit as a musician for a bit because I, I, I didn't find my satisfaction in what I was doing until I met um, a person, a second man in Mukushi back home that encouraged me to follow what I had in my heart. And that simply meant me accepting that I'm African and I have to sell my culture to the rest of the world. It wasn't easy and it's never been easy because I am trying to do music in an era that has moved away from the cultural music that we used to call Zambian music back then, especially you, you elderly people that actually celebrated some of the artists like, like Pickett, Shala, Pongozi and them, you can actually agree with me, you know, but that has never stopped me because one thing I, I realized is that every artist, it doesn't matter what you're doing, as an artist, you have to know who you are and what you stand for. And you are going to have that confidence to take it further, even beyond the borders. So for me, that's what I, I rode with. In 2015, I met Oliver Mtukudzi for the first time. And he also told me that, you know, you don't have to sing in English for the rest of the world to hear you. Music communicates. It has its way of communication. So you don't have to translate your songs. There's, it's not everyone that can manage to sing authentic English or, you know, like just sing proper English, you know. It's not everyone. At the end of the day, what you want to do is music and music is a feeling and if you can if you can communicate your emotions through what you are writing and what you are playing as a musician you are going to communicate to a lot of people you will talk to a lot of people i can give an example early this year i dropped a single which is called nde shirila it's uh, so when you listen to my songs i sing very deep bemba and a bit of lala and in the song i'm addressing issues to do with mental health I'm surprised that a lot of people, including uh, people in the West, reached out to me to actually tell me how this song was talking to their emotions and what they've been going through, even without understanding the language. You know, it got a lot of um, support from Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, and it's been playing in South Africa. So that tells me that music is beyond doing a language that everyone understands. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and, and I do think that the, the, the concept, the idea of not translating your work just extends beyond the, the music to it. I mean, I think that a lot of the time, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier before you joined us, James, that part of the problem is that sometimes you feel like you have to produce a very specific kind of art. And I think it does go back to not translating things and just hoping that people will, will you know, those who get it will get it. You know, because I, I think that there's so much that's lost in translation um, in, in the first place. Um, but I do also want to talk a little bit about when we're talking about Africa or when the West is talking about Africa, um, there's this pitfall that um, in four or five countries, you have South Africa, you have Nigeria, Ghana, <laughs> you know, Senegal. <laughs> it's, it's very Ethiopia, Kenya. You have very specific um, countries that are being referred to as the continent and coming from Malawi or even um, Zambia, which is talked about a little bit more than Malawi, but um, as a Malawian myself, you know, just th there's, there's this exclusion, I feel, when people are having conversations about Africa and want to talk about cosmopolitanism, you know, like Afro-cosmopolitanism. How can we work to change that so that we are recognizing all aspects and everybody from the continent and because people talk about oh africa is very big yes but then when it actually comes to referring to specific countries you can only name three how come you know so um how do we then combat that using our work and networks um in what ways have you um guys also just been um leveraging your own networks to to tackle it from that angle as well so as um, as a musician, um, as a musician, as an as 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 an artist, honestly, um, I've realized that what really causes that is that a lot of us Africans don't have confidence in what we produce and the the, the things that we we stand for. You know, we don't have the confidence. 
And I think what has helped a lot of countries like like uh, Nigeria, Kenya, apart from their 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 population, is also the confidence that they carry. And I know that most of you have experienced Nigerians on the streets, and you see the fire they carry in how they talk to you, how they sell their dreams to you. You know, they just have that thing. It doesn't matter what they are selling; you will buy it. Even if it's a small bottle of perfume, you are going to buy it. You know, just the confidence they carry. So I think the rest of Africa needs to learn from that, you know, because at the end of the day, what they are making and what we are making, there's no difference. We are all Africans. We carry the same skin. They, we have the same blood. You know what I mean? So we, we stand for the same beliefs. If you if you ask me, the cultures actually are, this, are similar, you know. The, the other time, the, the, like, like a few months ago, I realized that people in Cameroon actually sound like people in, in Wapula province in Zambia. You know, they actually have a similar tonation and culture. We, we are one and the same people, but what we love is having the same confidence, you know. So we shouldn't think I have to translate my songs or I have to translate my my painting or whatnot for the rest of Africa to get me. No, what we just need is that fire to believe that whatever I'm making is going to be bought everywhere across Africa. That's what we need. Well, I would love to hear from you and uh, your perspective. You know, it's very, very true. These are the things we are talking about. Confidence is what is missing. But then, on the other side, when people come who are discussing things, then people are saying, for instance, we were at one time writing a uh, um, uh, the, the Zambian art book. I looked at the history of that. It's like uh, somehow I was not very much for the idea that people do things on their own. So I had to force my way and went there and people thought I was going to dispute whatever was going to be put in there. Though I didn't, yes, not be part of that, no painting, even now, if you say Zambia book, I'm not there myself, but I was there when this thing was done. You know, you, you talk about the history, and then in the talking, it looks like on the part of you, the Zambians themselves, your art is somehow apart, no, apparently looking under, and then like the main art is on top. You know, when you begin to say, naive art and then I personally felt naive art it looks like uh, yours has to be looked down upon I thought I think we can do everything the same way other people are doing I can do so I had now the feeling changed I started thinking why can't I paint like some of the masters because we can do anything anyone can do and even to go into the market internationally, we can go competing even at other people's game. We can do that. But that we are Africans, we maintain. And maintaining this situation, this, this, this position has got more advantage because nothing cannot be done. If you are doing things, for instance, my brother put it in local language, singing a song, you can do it so good that it reaches, it reaches the level of goodness of the thing that is well known. Maybe the best songs that are there on the market using your own language. So the same thing as in the art. We are talking about basketry and other things that are done in the rural areas. I think we haven't explored, especially with the wrong thinking that ours is inferior. We are made to think like that. More poetry, when I was working there, I'm sure, let, let me just get back a little bit to that. More poetry. If we had to maintain that and continue it, I personally began to think differently. I could sometimes go home, I made certain designs, and I said, okay, if there is an event, a party sort of, where people come, why can't we have a time when we can make sure that the whole surrounding is filled with Africanness? In this case, designs from more poetry. Because if I go to a, what is being done there, we started it at more poetry. More poetry started everything. 
There was nothing like that. We had to go into designing curtains, designing big pots, getting designs from curtains we put, we put in the pots, on the plates, on the pieces of material, and hang them around. You can imagine if you had to put everything, even on the tables and everything else, you, you put in the sitting room. The whole house can be changed. You can change the whole environment. Even if people are parking outside, you can change the whole environment by doing that. Now, those things, if you look at them, they will take you deep to the meaning of our own culture. Because some of these things, you will see them marked on a piece of paper, maybe piece of cloth decorated like that. Uh, a lot of people are selling these things, making marks with meaning they don't understand. Some of these things, when you go there, they'll be talking about maturation. They'll be talking about, uh, you know, the, you know, the time we experience when there's death. They'll be talking about uh, when people are harvesting and things like that. These drawings, you find them some, some of them in the caves. Some of them in the deep in the areas of Zambia, you find them. Now, you can get this information from the archives, national archives. You can get this information. It's very important in this case to give people the idea that when they do things, let them not just make marks because they think they look good. Marks have meaning. That line we draw here symbolizes, I'm sure, unconsciously, people, when you look at Africans walking, whether you're telling a story or you see a drawing, usually they were walking in a line. The youngest in front, the following, the following up to the, the father, always behind, with something to protect the family. He has to be behind to see everybody in front. Now, as they are moving from one place to another, others who come, they move in the same area. So you find that you make, you make, you make a pass, what you call a pass. That is a line you see when people are drawing subconsciously. When they started drawing, they were making lines linear. It was linear. That is a symbol. They were taking their own experience of joining from one place to another. The things that they were not conscious of, the road and the environment and things. They would draw animals, they would draw trees, they would draw a, a path, they would draw everything. That's what caused that. So that line is very, very important because it's a dividing line. And that line is what we pick to be very important to give us whatever we want in, in whatever shape we want. So it's very important to dig deep into the meaning of these things. The line can be there, but the symbol they make, what do they mean? Get those things out, improve upon, and then share with others, repeat and repeat and repeat until the whole world see. Mention other countries of Africa, like musicians do. They'll mention names, Africa, 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 so that those who don't know, they'll at least have a chance of saying, now, this person is talking about this. Is a Zambian musician. He's mentioning Congo, Cameroon. What do these do these countries belong to one continent? Are they all African countries? So artists, I I think we have to do the same thing. You know, picking something from my own country and even deliberately, you know, involve them. I mean, put them around whatever I'm doing. Something that creates at least an opportunity to 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 show in my painting, be it one that looks like it's done by someone from the West. After all, there's nothing that is of the West and of the East or what. Everything starts from here. After all, life starts from here. So we are one Africa, one, one man. I mean, white people are black. We are white. We are the same people. So we have to make sure that we, we, we create a balance. We share nicely as our friends have done in the West and move up to their label. Africa must be known everywhere. So we have um, five minutes left. Get time to take a question from the audience. Um, but before we get into the audience question, I did think that it was important to to sort of the recurring theme in this conversation has been responsibility. We have a responsibility as artists to make sure that we are leveraging our connections to make sure that we are responsibly connected with people in the rural areas to make sure that we are 
we have a responsibility to make sure that we are taking, we, we, we're owning our narratives, you know. Um, and Kwame Odame Dakwa from Ghana, who is in Accra right now, said, why should we feel slighted by someone the West, how the someone the West views us, the gay someone the West views us through? Um, and the, there's a comment I think everybody can look at in the chat, but... Um, Sima Itabaza um, more succinct, succinctly put the question is, what does cosmopolitanism look like outside of the Western slash white gaze, which I think is also what Kwame was um, alluding to. So I would like to hear um, from everybody. We'll start with uh, yeah. Dr. Sepo Musokotwane. Yes. We'll start with... Um, I'm itching to answer Abraham. that question, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so Kwame, to, in response to that, I'm taking an academic approach. I've got two minutes. And we have Ghanaian writers in 2016 October, they wrote a paper called Conceptual Art, the Untold Story of African Art by Oswani Kwaiku Esel and Ebenezer Akwa. I hope I pronounced that right. But basically, the paper talks about changing the narrative and understanding all the isms in art, the expressionism, the realism, you know, cubism and how art has evolved um, and how societies embrace that for different reasons. And I think what we as Africans need to do without making it Africanism is change the narrative, create a new uh, story, a new narrative told by us, about us, explaining our pieces and not having somebody else come as an explorer or, uh, you know, they're at an adventure or outsider looking in, tell our stories. So I hope that answers your question. Cosmopolitanism looks like Africanism with Chenna, with Hipego and Raphael and James Sakala. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, 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 I think it's very important. And I do love the digital space as um, that Ch Chenna is created so that the work is more accessible um, instead of a physical gallery space. But we have one minute left, so we... We'll say our goodbyes here. Um, thank you to oh. all for um, yeah. lending us uh, your knowledge, sharing um, your perspectives. Thank you to the audience for joining us as we had this um, lovely, illuminating chat. Please connect with all of us on social media, LinkedIn, all of that fun mm -hmm. stuff. Um, join the other panels that are going to be running all day. This conference is great. And um, thank you, Weezer, and the organizers for making this happen. Thanks for having us. All right. Yeah. Thank yes, you so much. Of the African narrative. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Over 50 people attending this right now. Um, to all of us that are in this session, we're about to head on over to the next session around building a value system for Renaissance um, with Mubian, Mubiana Kabage, Linda Kasonde, Gyude, I really hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Gyude Moore. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that correction. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Vuyowetu uh, Dubese and Kitawa Wemo. That panel starts just now and we can jump right in. Please don't forget to sanitize. COVID is not over. Mm -hmm. I don't know why people in the world think COVID is over, but it's As not. So not please sanitize. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Sanitize and stay indoors. Thank you so much for your time. Um, let's jump into the next panel. I hope you will be joining us. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.